Hello, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. Hi there. Hi, I'm Dr. Gigi. Thank you so much for coming to our webinar. And we're so happy that you're here with us and we'll get started in just a few minutes. And so that you're aware, this webinar will be recorded. We um, use them on occasion for marketing purposes. Um, if you're just joining us, we're doing Herbal Formulas webinar with Professor Bill Schoenbart. And we'll get started in just a minute, but uh, Dr. B Schoenbart wanted to say hello as well. Of course, I'm Dr. Gigi, your host. And uh, take it away, Dr. Bill Schoenbart. Hello. Looks so like we just got a few people here so far. Um, They'll be playing a, a uh, video that I already filmed. And then at the end, I'll, I'll be able to answer any questions you may have. So if you just put them in the, uh, in the chat box, Gigi will go through them one after another at the end. We'll, we'll get to all your questions. Absolutely. So if you see at the bottom of your screen here on Zoom, there will be, uh, once we get started, I don't know that you can see it just yet, uh, but there will be a little box icon in the chat, and that's where you'll put any questions that you haven't had a chance to ask yet. And uh, we'll go ahead and go through the ones we received already by email, and then we'll go through um, your chat questions, and we're very much looking forward to it. So we're just coming up here on five o'clock, so in a moment, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll start the video. But, um, but thank you again for coming this lovely evening. I don't know where everyone's joining us from, please do make sure that your, um, your microphone is on mute for us. That would be excellent. And, uh, and like I said, we'll, we'll be starting the video and then going into the Q&A. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna go ahead and, and mute myself here so that we can all hear the video. And once again, uh, we so appreciate you joining us on this Monday evening and, and we'll be recording this webinar so that you can watch it back later. And thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and get started just in a moment or two. And if you're just joining us here, this is Dr. Gigi Shamas. I'm your host, and we're letting some folks into the webinar, and we're going to get started in just a moment. Thank you so much for joining. Hi there, Dr. Gigi here again. We're letting people in, so I just wanted to uh, let you know, of course, that we are recording this webinar. This is the Herbal Formulas webinar with Dr. Bill Schoenbart, who was my professor when I was a student. So very, very happy to have him here. And we're gonna start playing his video and then we'll go directly into our Q&A after that. Please make sure that um, as a participant that your microphone is on mute and we'll get started shortly with the video. And we are recording um, and then we'll be able to play it back later, or use the footage for other things like that. And thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Monday evening. Thanks again. Hi, my name is Bill Schoenbart. I'm the Associate Chair of the Herb Department at Five Branches University. And I actually went to school here back in 1988 and learned about herbs in this very same herb room. I'd like to talk today about uh, herbal medicine in general, how it's done in Chinese medicine. We do categories, therapeutic categories. So instead of anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, things like that, it's based on Chinese therapeutic energetics. So for example, we've got the release exterior category, warm and cool. That's for the common cold. So if you have the kind of common cold where you have chills and body aches, use the warm exterior releasing. If you have the type of cold or flu where you have fever, thirst, sore throat, use the cooling ones. Then there's drain fire herbs. Those are for extreme heat, can be used for serious dermatological conditions like psoriasis, eczema, and you've got 
herbs that relieve toxic heat, that's used for infections and other sorts of conditions like that. And there's numerous categories that cover all the various conditions that you might encounter. Today I'm going to talk about how to make a decoction with bulk herbs. Decoctions are the most potent way to take herbs, uh, and it's often the most commonly used traditional method of preparing them. So I've already uh, cooked one. I use the Instant Pot. Traditionally, you would use an actual pot and boil them in the pot and then strain it. I like using the Instant Pot for a number of reasons. First of all, it cooks um, in a sealed condition. So the essential oils don't evaporate off the way they do in a normal decoction. And there's certain aromatic herbs that you have to add at the end because otherwise the essential oils boil off. You don't have to do that with the Instant Pot because it retains all the essential oils. So I'm going to show you a really simple formula called Li Jung Wan Regulate the Middle Pill, also called Ginseng and Ginger Formula. And here's the basic way to make a formula. So the typical dose, it's four herbs, ginseng, ginger, attractive lodis, and a honey prepared licorice. So generally speaking, nine or 10 grams of each. With licorice, we try to keep it down to six grams because studies have shown you can take six grams of licorice daily long-term without it causing any issues with blood pressure. So the first one is, this is ginseng. This is red ginseng. Red ginseng and white ginseng are actually the same plant. Red ginseng is sliced and steamed and dried repeatedly, and it gives it a slightly warmer property. So I'm going to measure out 10 grams. So there's 10 grams of ginseng. Then the Attractylodes will also measure out 10 grams. These are all drawers from the Tonify Chi category. And I'll explain how the formula works. So here's 10 grams of Attractylodes. And then dried ginger. This is basically just fresh ginger that's sliced and dried. ginger. And last is the honey baked licorice. And that's going to be six grams, which is pretty much a standard dose. There's only a few formulas that use more than that, but it's quite safe to do licorice daily at six grams. So this is Li Jung Wan, regulate the middle pill. Other forms these are granules. This is also Li Jung Wan. So this is a boiled in the factory and then it's dried in a tower. So you've got kind of like instant coffee. You stir it into some water and take it. So it's more convenient. It's not as potent as a decoction, but it's still quite effective. And there's modifications. This is called Fuzi Li Jung Wan. It's got an herb called Fuzi added to it that makes it very, very warming. So this is if someone has extreme cold in their digestive system. So it's called regulate the middle powder because it it's strengthens the vital energy and strengthens digestion. Ginseng, the, uh, one of the major herbs in the formula, energizes the body, enhances immunity, enhances resistance to illness, and strengthens the digestion. Dry ginger, ganjang, that warms the middle burner and helps prevent cold causing stomach pain, diarrhea. Uh, Attractylodes, baiju, that also strengthens the digestive function, tonifies what's called the spleen chi, and that removes dampness from the body, which causes you to be sluggish and have poor digestion. And jirgansau, the honey-baked licorice, that is a harmonizing herb. It's in many, many formulas in Chinese medicine. It also, in its honey-prepared form, can help strengthen the digestive energy. So, Renchen, Ginseng, Baiju, Attractylodes, Ganjiang, Dry Ginger, 
Dragoncell prepared licorice. That's regulate the middle powder. So I already cooked some in the Instant Pot and I'm gonna show you how we do that. So now we're going to strain the finished decoction. This previously cooked under pressure cook on the Instant Pot, which is 35 minutes under pressure. And there's a, there's a metal button that stays out when the pressure is up and it, you allow it to drop down naturally. You don't release the pressure manually. That way you retain all the essential oils. So on this last procedure is what you would do if you boiled it in a pot also. So I like getting a four cup measuring cup with a strainer because then it just sits in there. You don't have to balance it. And here it is. So the dregs, they can just be composted. And that's a finished decoction. So this amount of herbs can be all taken in one day for a more serious condition, or it can even be taken over two or three days, depending on the individual and the condition. And so that's it. And because it's a tonifying formula, it actually tastes quite good. Spicy from the ginger, sweet from the licorice and the ginseng, a little aromatic from the Attractylodes. So that's how to prepare a decoction. So what we just made, this formula is called a tonifying formula. This strengthens the body and um, during times of COVID, this would be a formula you would take to strengthen your immune system to try to prevent getting sick. Once someone actually catches COVID or cold or flu, then a formula like this is contraindicated. It can actually make the condition worse. So in that case, you would use formulas that are very specific for cold and flu. And uh, I've treated a number of COVID patients. None of them were hospitalized but uh, a number of people with it and they responded very well to herbs. But normally with a common cold, you'll give them herbs, exterior releasing herbs to help them fight off the cold. And within a couple of days after they're better, they can take tonifying herbs to strengthen their system again. But we found that you can't do that with COVID. You got to give them a week, 10 days or more uh, to recover. Otherwise you tonify too soon and they can also get worse. So it's always important in Chinese medicine to do a differential diagnosis. Tonifying herbs like this also are not so good for someone who has a lot of stagnation and heat in their system. Uh, every, everyone gets different formulas based on their diagnosis. And we diagnose things according to their different organs of their body, the Chinese medical organs, the lungs, the liver, the kidney, the spleen, the heart and the levels of yin and yang and qi and blood. And then we use pernicious influences like wind, damp, heat, cold, dryness. And all these things are based on observation of nature over many thousands of years in China. So by having these diagnostic methods, we can select a formula that's very, very specific to the individual. And these formulas can be modified. I already mentioned this one formula Fuzi Li Jingwan, you would add Fuzi to it if the person has a really extreme cold as their symptom. If they didn't have a lot of cold, we probably wouldn't use ginseng. We'd probably use something called Dangshen, Codenopsis, which also strengthens the vital energy, but it's not so heating. So there's really unlimited modifications of formulas that we can use. Well, thank you for attending the webinar today. It's been my pleasure to talk with you. Very grateful to Five Branches for teaching me this incredible medicine and to my teachers, some of whom are still even teaching 30 years later to this day. And just a reminder, Chinese herbal medicine is uh, extraordinarily complex and versatile and effective. So make sure you see someone who is trained in Chinese medicine who can give you an accurate differential diagnosis. That way you can get a formula that's appropriate to your specific needs. And then by monitoring your progress, they can modify the formula, then eventually 
you can be weaned off it and maintain uh, vibrant health. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Wonderful to see all these faces. I saw a couple folks come in that I knew from way back in 2004 when I was first starting my journey at Five Branches Institute. Uh, my name is Dr. Gigi. I am a licensed acupuncturist, a doctor of natural health, and Bill Schoenbart was my professor, one of my very first professors when I started at Five Branches many years ago. Five Branches was founded in 1984. Um, the Santa Cruz campus was the first one, and then the San Jose campus opened in 2005. And we're very grateful to be here speaking with all of you. We're gonna answer your questions. And I just wanted to let you know that if you're interested in Chinese medicine, if you might wanna be a healer, you're trying to figure out if this is a good path for you, go to the website, it's fivebranches.edu. So it's all spelled out, fivebranches.edu. And there's a little tab for future students. You can um, contact your admissions reps. You can uh, take trial courses so many great things that you can do. And so we're gonna jump right into the Q&A in just a moment here. And please do use the chat at the bottom of your screen to ask further questions. We've already received some via email. So I'm gonna get started uh, with Dr. Bill. Bill Schoenbart, can you tell us, first of all, a little bit about what brought you to Chinese medicine? And can you tell us also what books and resources you recommend for someone wanting to get started in herbalism? Sure. Thanks, Gigi. Um, I had a great interest in learning a traditional herbal system. I actually didn't know about Chinese medicine. So I was considering going to naturopathic school. And uh, then uh, I had a friend who was dating someone at Five Branches. And I told her I was moving to Oregon to go to naturopathic school. And she said, oh, Five Branches? She was confused, probably. Um, so I didn't even know about it. I came and visited and I really liked what I saw. I really liked that you didn't really need technology to make a diagnosis. You can just ask questions, observe the tongue and the face and take the pulse and come up with a diagnosis and a treatment plan. I was also very attracted to the fact that it had been practiced for thousands of years. So it was definitely tried and true. So that's what brought me to uh, Chinese medicine back in 1988. So, and as I said, I learned herbs in that exact same room all those years ago. Um, what was your other question, Gigi, books? Yes, we were wondering about, uh, somebody emailed ahead of time and they were curious about books and other resources for someone just getting started in the world of herbalism. Well, um, generally the books that students use are, are fairly advanced. Um, let me I'll share my screen. Give me a second here. And once again, I'm not sure if you all can see, but at the bottom of your screen, I just wrote a little something about how you can connect with our admissions reps. Please feel free to use that chat for your questions. Let's see. So this is the uh, textbook for, uh, that is used in school, Foundations of Chinese Medicine by Giovanni Masiosia. This is the third edition, but if you're not gonna be going to school and you just wanna read it, you can get one of the earlier ones. Like here's, here's one of his earlier ones for just $29. So it's Foundations of Chinese Medicine by Giovanni Masiosia. It's kind of hard to see his name here. An excellent book and one that you use a lot as an acupuncturist and um, one of the books, including The Web That Has No Weaver, That's that brings many, <laughs> many people, many <laughs> people to, <laughs> to Chinese medicine. Book. That's right, many of us started by looking at either the foundations of Chinese medicine or the web that has no weaver, both of which highly recommended from myself. The web that has no weaver is probably the best beginner's book. We still recommend that people read it before they start school. It's pretty small, but it's 
Ted, Ted Kapchuk was very, very clear in his writing. The, uh, the foundations would be more detailed. So if you read the web and you're really still interested, you can get the foundations. And like I said, if you're not planning to uh, register as a student in the near future, you don't need the third edition. You can get a really inexpensive first or second edition. And then if you want just a basic Chinese medical theory, here's my website. Are you seeing that on the screen, Gigi? Um, right now I am, yes. Mm -hmm. So this is my website, drbillschoenbart.com. If you go under resources, there's a TCM ebook there, and it's got the basics of Chinese medicine. So very nice. Mm -hmm. That would be something you can just do right away for free. That is excellent. And we did have a question about um, what herbs do you like to use when you're cooking foods? So maybe if you're cooking a lamb dish or if you're cooking chicken, what do you like to add to it for your health? Well, um, generally you want the herbs that have a good flavor, but also are strengthening. There are other herbs that have a little more of an aromatic or a bitter flavor that a really skilled chef could add them in tiny amounts. But I'm going to show you ones that everyone can use. So I'm going to share my screen again. Are you seeing uh, Wang Chi? Yes. Mm -hmm. so this is astragalus. Um, this, this image here, that's a long cut. They kind of look like tongue depressors. But they also come in these little cross cuts. Astragalus or Huang Chi is very sweet flavored. It's really mild. You can't eat it though, it's woody. So what you would, the way you would cook with that is you would boil it for maybe half an hour, then strain it out and then use that liquid as a soup stock. Same thing with Codenopsis. I'll show you that one, Dongshen. This is Dongshen Codenopsis. This is also a very mild, sweet flavor, but once again, it it's, doesn't cook soft enough to eat, so it's best to strain it out. I mean, you can chew on it, but it's still gonna be pretty fibrous. You wouldn't wanna put it in a meal. But on the other hand, Shan Yao, this is a yam. You can leave this in. This is a dried medicinal yam, and it's just sweet and mild flavored. But notice, see how white some of these are? They're, they've been uh, treated with sulfites. So you want, see how the, this natural one looks more tan? This one looks a little yellowish. So th this one here is a little bit, see how it's got a little bit of a yellowish color? Oh yeah, it. absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that you want to get one of those. So people are asking where to get them. The problem with Chinese herbs, if you live in Santa Cruz, I don't know how many of you do, but you can go to the herb room they sell bulk Chinese herbs, good quality. Otherwise, uh, Spring Wind has the best quality, but they don't sell bulk herbs to anyone besides practitioners. So you could actually ask your practitioner, I heard Codenopsis or Astragalus or Chinese yam, also goji berries, which you can get at any health food store. Those are really great in soups and stews. And just have your practitioner buy you a pound, and, and, you know, it's also helpful if your practitioner knows, well, oh, that's a little bit too warm for you, or that might give you a headache. Um, so let me see what else we got here. Absolutely, yes. And we did want to mention that um, it's best, of course, for the lay public to see an acupuncturist, see a, a Chinese herbalist. It's a, a better idea, really, than doing this all by yourself, um, because we do have quite a bit of training. We used to laugh about how much training, in fact, that we had to go through to get these, um, these degrees, the Master of Chinese Medicine degree, the uh, doctorate degree, and Five Branches has a wonderful herbal reputation. We sometimes called it herbs, acupuncture, and the other three branches. So it's a very high quality herbal program that we have in um, at Five Branches. And somebody wanted to know, how can you incorporate Western herbs into the Chinese formulas? That's an interesting one. Well, this kind of transitions to that, and I'll address mm. that more. This is shiitake mushrooms. Yeah. So that's a, these are used in Chinese medicine, it's called shanggu. 
And shiitakes uh, have uh, very powerful effects on the immune system, healthy for the liver. And of course, they're delicious. You can just cook them as a food because they are. Another one is called maitake grifola. These are quite delicious and uh, very powerful strengthening for the immune system, have anti-cancer properties, and they, they're really, really very tasty. And then uh, you may have heard of lion's mane mushroom. Um, it's a little harder to find in a, in a grocery store, but some stores will have it. I know the Santa Cruz Farmer's Market, they do sell some fresh lion's mane. You can also buy grow kits, um, Far West Fungi in Santa Cruz. They also, I believe they do shipping. You, you spray water on the kit and you grow your own lion's mane mushrooms. So lion's mane is, has kind of a seafood flavor. It tastes a little like crab. In fact, mm. people make vegan crab cakes with them. And lion's mane, in addition to the usual um, immune strengthening benefits, lion's mane has powerful effects on cognition. It can be used in, in um, early stages before dementia sets in, where people start, you know, forgetting words and things like that. That's so excellent. That's full on dementia. It's really hard to come back. But and yeah. even way before that, if you just want to improve your memory, your cognition, mm -hmm. it's also used for uh, psychoemotional disorders like depression. Of course, someone has severe depression. They need uh, medical help, but it's a it's a wonderful mushroom, delicious and very uh, powerful. And then uh, the question is how to incorporate Western herbs. Well, if you're if your Western herbalism is practiced a little differently, it's a little more biomedical, mm -hmm. anti-inflammatory herbs, and you know things like that. And and it's a it's also a, a long tradition from Europe. And uh, Native American herbalism is, is also goes into that. If you're going to be a Chinese medicine practitioner, typically you're going to make a formula based on traditional Chinese formulas. But if you know Western herbs, you can plug in a few herbs. Mm -hmm. I used to use a lot of them, but I, but I decided I was really going to go deeper and just use traditional formulas or modify traditional formulas. So I really could learn much better how, what they do. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll sometimes put uh, ashwagandha in a formula, which is an Ayurvedic herb, or bacopa, another herb that's really great for cognition from Ayurveda, or maybe black cohosh or chamomile. So I'll use those as a single herb addition to a formula. And mm. uh, that works just fine, as long as you know both systems. Very good, wonderful. And, um, and we had a couple questions actually in the chat. I see just about some spellings and I, I don't wanna get it wrong. I'm not sure exactly which herbs uh, she might be referring to. So Bill, if you get a chance to check just the spellings for certain of the herbs that you've mentioned, and if you get a chance to pop it into the chat. And, um, and meanwhile, we were gonna ask about um, a particular uh, way that you might know that the vital nutrients are maintained when cooked. I liked that question. We got that via email. And, um, and I think that's actually, it leads us back to why you would choose an acupuncturist herbalist to assist you. Um, you don't wanna overcook your herbs. You don't wanna, same as uh, sometimes overcooking your food, you can reach a certain potency. And uh, past that point, you can have a lack of efficacy. So we're talking about how do you know that the vital nutrients are going to be maintained when cooked? It's one way to bring out the, the potency via cooking, but how do you not overcook? That's another reason I like the instant pot because mm. you don't lose, we're not really looking at nutrients with the medicinal herbs. We're looking more for the therapeutic compounds, mm -hmm. I believe is, is a related question. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, Aromatic herbs are more delicate, especially when you're cooking them in a pot, which is what was done for thousands of years until we had pressure cookers. They would typically be added at the end and just cook for five or 10 minutes. So mm -hmm. you preserve the essential oils. Otherwise you just cook it so much of the uh, potent constituents out of it. Um, the more woody, sweet, less aromatic herbs like 
the astragalus and cordonopsis and the yam that we looked at, those can be cooked fairly long without losing anything because it doesn't evaporate off. But generally speaking, 30, 35 minutes is a good cooking time. And if you have time, you can soak the herbs for an hour beforehand. So none of the cooking time is spent the water penetrating the herb. With the Instant Pot, you don't have to do that because it takes maybe 15, 20 minutes to get up to heat. And then when, when it's done, it takes another 45 minutes to cool down. So you are, you are getting quite a bit out of it. But, but as far as nutrients go, we're looking, talking more about foods in that case. And that's, that's much more critical as far as cooking time. You can, asparagus, you cook it more than five minutes, you ruin it. <laughs> right, exactly. And that, that actually leads me to the question that I think is on everyone's mind, which is you were cooking with the Instant Pot in the video. Um, can you tell me, I don't use a, a pressure cooker. I, I actually never have. Is it one level of pressure? I know you cook for about 35 minutes. Is it just a set level of pressure or do you have to set it to, to use a certain amount of pressure to do so? There's a lot of different Instant Pots. Okay. With technology, I tend to get something, do the thing I wanna do with it and I don't know anything else about it. Okay. So I know there's a, but there's a lot of different types where you can select the time, but generally mm. I'll, I'll cook it under high pressure for 30, 35 minutes. And, I get really good quality decoctions because I know what they should taste like. Absolutely. And we got a question by email that I'm going to segue into, which is what if someone doesn't have an instant pot, can they use a crock pot and how, how would they do that? Yeah, crock pot is basically uh, the same as, same principle as a regular pot. Okay. Mm -hmm. So typically, like a, a formula of the size of the one I showed you in the, in the video, typically you would only need four cups of water for a small formula like that. And you'd boil it for 30 minutes, you'd end up with maybe three cups. Um, but uh, if you're gonna cook a large formula in a pot, you might mm -hmm. need four, five, even six, sometimes seven cups with an enormous formula. Either way, you're gonna cook it for 30 minutes. So whether it's a crock pot, a boiling pot, you know, regular regular cooking pot. You just bring it up to a high boil and then turn it down to a very low boil, set a timer. You always want to set a timer because it's inevitable. You'll get busy and forget about it and you'll cook all the water out. And, and That's right. Room. So uh, generally after 30 minutes, just turn off the heat, leave the lid on because during the cool down process, it's still extracting because the lid's on essential oils are evaporating, hitting the lid and then coming back into it. Then you just strain it the way I did in the video. And that can either be for three doses in one day for more serious conditions, or it can be one dose a day for three days. Very good. And we're getting some great questions. I wanna make sure we don't miss any. Um, I'm gonna ask this one from the chat. What would be good additions to a bean or cereal mixture for dampness? Well, I, I would always say, what do you mean by dampness? I don't know mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're a practitioner or a student or, so it depends what you mean by dampness. I'll, I'll start and if I'm not hitting on what you were thinking, you can add more. Like for example, if someone tends to have fluid retention, azuki beans are really good for that. They yeah. tend to clear heat and remove excess fluid from the body. If you have damp heat where you have this yellow, kind of sticky coating on your tongue, you know, nausea, liver issues, uh, mung beans are good for that. He, and these are all in the Materia Medica text. I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> I know enough to be dangerous. That's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that kind of, um, speaking of knowing enough to be dangerous, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this one. Is it necessary to learn about the herbs to take the California license test to get California acupuncture licenses? Absolutely, absolutely. So there are um, many different requirements to be an acupuncturist in California. Uh, I think fewer to be an acupuncturist elsewhere, but some states are very, very rigorous these days. I know uh, Nevada has its own um, state licensing test. The California test is one of the hardest ones to pass. Um, but at any rate, 
uh, yes, and you would also want to go to a California school in general so that you can get your um, certification, your degree, and then you get your license. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave once again in the chat the information for our admissions advisors because if you are either looking to become an acupuncturist or already an acupuncturist looking to get your doctorate, Five Branches has a lot of options for you. Of course, website fivebranches.edu. And I'm also going to put in the chat the, um, the calendar links where you can very quickly and easily get on the calendar for our admissions advisors. How about this one from email? How do we grow mugwort in our yard? I thought that was a good one for Bill. How do you not grow mugwort in your yard? <laughs> Once you plant it, it's going to take over. <laughs> so the, the mugwort that's, I don't know if you guys are all from California or not, but because uh, of course, different parts of the country have different species. Uh, around here, we have Artemisia douglasiana. Um, that's, that's the mugwort that grows wild around here. You plant it and it spreads like crazy. Um, let me show you, I'll, I'm going to share a site where you can buy seeds and plants. Is uh, strictly medicinal. It used to be called Verizon Herbs. Thank you so much, and keep on asking your questions in our chat. We're getting to uh, uh, okay. we're going to get to all of them, and we will also be, of course, we're recording now. We'll be sending this recording to you, and you can certainly follow up with any further questions that you have, but put those questions in the chat. This is a, this is his Facebook group. I'm gonna take it to the, to the website. It used to be called Horizon Herbs. Uh, this is Richo Czech and his family. They were, uh, they've been in Southern Oregon for decades now. He's highly experienced at growing. So if you can either get plants, seeds, so if, if you want to look at plants, medicinal herb plants, A to D, actually I should have, let's see if it's under Artemisia. Yeah, it should be here. So here's Artemisia annua, that's a different species. Oh, that's the only one he's got. So he doesn't have mugwort. I will check under M just to see. But anyway. Perfect. And oh, yes. And while you're doing that, I just wanted to um, to mention, I did see it in the chat, um, perhaps to myself. No, this is to everyone. Um, basically, the question has to do with, do you start learning immediately the herbalism at Five Branches and what is unique about it compared to other TCM schools? So I made the joke earlier, we call it Five Branches, herbs, acupuncture, and the other three branches, that's kind of funny. There's actually, you know, dietetics, nutrition, energetics. There's, there's a lot that you will learn um, at five branches. But the unique quality is, to me, as a former student, really twofold. Um, I graduated in 2008, and I've never stopped thinking about the community and how supported I felt. As a student, I had a lot of mentors that were also students. Bill Schoenbart, one of my professors. And now, years later, after having my own private practice, after working at Modern Acupuncture, many different sort of paths that acupuncture took me, and now working at Five Branches again. And I'm in that community once more again. I never really left it. So I think the community is incredible and the very, very high quality of our faculty. So those are the things that we really rely on in terms of our uniqueness because you will need those for getting through a, a very rigorous program. And go right ahead, Bill, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that was a great question for myself as a graduate, so thank you. So it, it, the mugworts, he's got two, he's got common mugwort, Artemisia vulgaris, Western mugwort, Artemisia ludoviciana. If you look under seeds, medicinal herb seeds. Let's see. And perhaps what we could do too is send out these links to, um, to you all, the participants, after this session so that you're getting a, a sense of it and you can follow up too if you'd like to grow your own. Uh, perhaps we can include some of the different links uh, that you're seeing here. And also a lot of times in farmer's markets, you'll see people with, like here's Chinese mint, 
that's also quite invasive. Sometimes you just want to put them in a pot or cut the bottom out of a pot and plant it in the ground. So he's got the same two uh, mugwort species with seeds also. So that is, let me get you, give you the, put it in the chat. That's great. And I was going to say, this is so funny because we keep segueing into other things. Um, <laughs> so Bill, how do you grow if you don't have a garden? Can you grow in containers? That was one of our questions from prior. Some plants do well in containers, some don't. Mm -hmm. Like for example, astragalus would be really hard to grow in a container because the root's so, so long. Yeah. The, the leafy things, uh, juhua, chrysanthemum, boha, the Chinese mint, they would grow just fine in a container. They don't Excellent. thrive as well as they do in the ground, but yeah. generally if you use good soil and you have drainage on the bottom so it doesn't have stagnant water and you have to be more careful about, you know, uh, watering properly if it's in a pot because they dry out easier. Yep. Mm -hmm. That sounds excellent. I was going to say that's, um, uh, you know, the question that, that many of us ha have to ask is, should we source these ourselves? Generally, our answer is going to be through an acupuncturist. Um, and if you are an acupuncturist, you know, where do you like to go and can you grow them on your own? And as a, a lay person, can you, you know, grow them on your own? Certain ones, yes, and adding to the foods, but you want to make sure that you're not um, necessarily only looking at your own self for the diagnosis. Somebody else should be looking at your tongue, looking at your pulse, doing all the ways that we diagnose as acupuncturists, because that's a, a very helpful thing. Your acupuncturist can really assist you and tell you what to add. Uh, what about alcohol extractions, Professor? Is there a benefit to alcohol extractions and how can one do a dual extraction method is the question. I'll explain that. I just put up another site, Pacific Botanicals. They've got a lot of really good quality organic herbs. I'll put it in the chat and I'll answer the question. More Western, but they do have some Chinese. Mountain Rose is another good site. Frontier has some good stuff. So it's possible to get some of these uh, on your own. Oh, it looks like I did a direct message, sorry. I was going to say, I did not see that in the chat, um, but that is, yes, you're going to put that right in there and we will add them to the emails. But here's something else that's kind of interesting. Uh, we would love to be both a dispensary as well as an herbal school. Now, often we just dispense herbs at Five Branches for the patients that we see right there, but we are looking to uh, potentially increase and so do a dispensary for other acupuncturists all around the nation. Um, so that's an idea that, that we're uh, in progress with. And um, oh yes, and we're, yes, and so the, the, I didn't want to interrupt you, alcohol extractions and even I hadn't really heard about a dual extraction method. So a dual extraction is, a regular tincture is simple. You take, you know, Depending on the herb, 95% ethanol, 60% ethanol, depending on the herb, and just soak it for two weeks, strain it, and you've got a tincture. Um, generally, one gram of starting dried herb to five or six milliliters of liquid at the end. A dual extraction is when you want to get both water soluble and alcohol soluble. Like, for example, uh, reishi, Ganoderma lucidum one of the medicinal mushrooms. You can't cook with it, it's fairly bitter. Some species, when they're very, very young and fresh on a log, you can cut a piece off of it and cook it, but the reishi that you see in medicine is not uh, edible, it's more for medicine. So that has got water-soluble compounds and alcohol-soluble compounds. So what you do in that case is you boil it in a decoction, like we talked about before, you strain it and save that, and then you take the dregs, which is called the mark, M-A-R-C. You take those after you've strained it and you put them in alcohol and you let it soak for a couple of weeks. Then you strain that, then you mix it together. You just want to make sure you calculate it so that the end percentage of alcohol is 25 to 35%. Otherwise it won't preserve it. You'll have to keep it in the refrigerator otherwise. So that's a dual extraction. You're getting both 
water soluble and alcohol soluble. And it's that is very you, get, interesting. you get a little more of it than if you just use like say vodka, which has some water, some alcohol. You're you're boiling it, you're like Chinese medicine, then you're extracting it uh, like in Western tincture making. And there's there's good books on that. Uh, in fact, Horizon Herbs, that same site, uh, oh no, they call it uh, Strictly Medicinals now. Um, Strictly Medicinals, Richo has a book on how to make medicine and it's very, very easy to follow. Mm -hmm. James Green also has a book that you can find on Amazon. So these are all really good books on making your own tinctures. But I don't, I don't use tinctures of Chinese herbs. Um, I'll use fluid extracts where, where they're done that dual extraction method, but I, uh, I don't find tinctures of Chinese herbs to be as effective as when they're boiled or the granular formulas that are mixed. I myself found in my private practice that the, the granules seem to combine the convenience with the potency the best. Um, for, for me personally, I did find that and for my patients, but everybody has um, uh, different ways of doing it. And uh, some people really wanna boil the herbs and you wanna be able to do that for them. And it is one of the best ways to customize. So as an acupuncturist, uh, knowing your raw herbs, very, very important. But I did see a question in the, in the chat about, are there um, classes whereby at Five Branches, we talk about growing the herbs? I would say not that much about growing the herbs. Um, mostly you're learning how to practice with them once they're already made. But, um, but we do like to add, so this kind of webinar is part of five branches. Um, and sometimes they do pre-COVID, they would do herbal walks and show students how to do so, making them on windowsills. And I remember a party where we all drank a lot of medicinal wine and that had been made by the students after a sort of, it was an informal class, let's put it that way. It wasn't really a class, but it was a really fun party. So, um, so Bill, we do wanted to um, ask you also, uh, you know, a couple people, they, they said, do you have the two links for who makes extractions? That's interesting. I think that, oh, can I think, you add to the chat? The two I think they might be asking about the two the books. The two types of oh, the two yeah. books. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very they good. Extractions. They teach you how to. I'll yes. That. And also, very good. I don't know how many of you are in the Bay Area, but you know, the Berkeley Botanical Garden has a Chinese medicine section. And it's got dozens of Chinese herbs growing there with little labels on them. I'm, I'm going to be planting some in a community garden in Santa Cruz. So that'll be available for people to look at. But the Berkeley Botanical Garden is, it's a wonderful garden anyway. You could spend the whole day there. But that would be a good place to look. Uh, let me see. Very good. And we almost thought about doing sort of a video about you walking through and looking at the different herbs, but it, it something about being in the herb room at Five Branches and cooking with the Instant Pot. There's um, something really potent, if you will, about that. Um, oh, and also, how would one create tinctures for kids? I'll explain that in a second. So here's Strictly Medicinals again, and the, and the link is in the chat. So books, there it is, Making Plant Medicine. Really a wonderful book, very easy to read. So you can find that on that Strictly Medicinal site. Excellent. The other one, the other one is James Green. Here it is. This is James Green's book. This is Amazon right here. The Herbal Medicine Maker's Handbook. Mm -hmm. So this one is uh, way more extensive than uh, the one from Strictly Medicinals, but it's also, both of them are very good. It's really, uh, you'll be very comfortable making your own tinctures and extracts and liniments and ointments. Uh, what was that question, Gina? It, it had to do with how you would make extractions, nutrient-rich extractions for kids specifically. Kids, you want to make uh, glycerides. You actually extract it in glycerin. They're not as strong, but um, basically you just extract the herbs in glycerin. And I'm quite sure that James's book will have that. And I think Richo's does also. 
and glycerin is sweet, so kids will take it. Some kids are just really good herb takers. Um, just, it just depends on the kid. Uh, you can give them granules and mix them with applesauce. So there's, there's a few different ways to do it. And there's also, uh, glycerites are probably the easiest way to get herbs into little kids. I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, I have a one-year-old, so trying to get her to take anything is not so easy, but but a little bit of sugar added can help quite a bit. Um, and being very careful with kids, of course, with anything that you would give them. Um, you know, you, you have to be extra careful with all of the different herbs. You have to be careful sometimes giving them too much water. So, you know, it's not necessarily the herbs, but you do have to be quite, quite cautious. Um, and then we're going to end pretty soon. I just want everyone to type in your last questions if you uh, if you have more. And also um, wanted to know, it sounds like you've covered this, Bill, but specifically you were talking about how a person would get um, the herbs if they were looking for the reputable, you know, sellers. I did see earlier in the chat, somebody said, go to different, um, uh, you know, Chinatown, Asian markets, things like that. I, I would actually say be very cautious to do so. I, I would rather you perhaps maybe follow some of the links that, that Bill is looking at and, and what your acupuncturist would say. You do want to be pretty cautious about that. You especially don't want to just go to random stalls in Chinatown because you don't know anything about the quality control. There was actually an event in Chinatown where a very, very poisonous herb was in a bag of herbs oh, and unlisted. So yeah. there's nothing wrong with Chinatown. There's wonderful places there, but unless you're really, really educated in herb quality and identity, it's it, you don't know what you're gonna get. Spring Wind is the best, but you can't order directly from them. Um, some of those sites I showed you do have some Chinese herbs like the astragalus, codinopsis, the ones that you're gonna wanna cook with. Um, I actually called them before the webinar to see if they would sell to non-practitioners, but they, they, they don't for safety reasons. But uh, if you have a practitioner, I'm sure they'd be happy to order you a pound of those herbs. Or if you live in Santa Cruz, just go to the herb room on Mission Street. They, they've got bins of bulk herbs. And there's one of our graduates, um, Ben Zappin, runs a Berkeley storefront that is excellent called Five, oh, right. Fa Five Flavors Pharmacy, I believe. Right. So depending on where you are in the Bay Area, but if you're not in the Bay Area, um, you know, there's certainly places that you can find them online. The best is really to get yourself a practitioner. Um, you can find one through AccuFinder.com. That's a great way to check uh, your um, general area via your zip code. But we do want to make sure that uh, we're not leaving anyone out. Any last questions? And I am going to put in our chat box the, the website um, for, I think we've covered everything, for um, fivebranches.edu once again. And that's a great way to keep in touch with us, come on to other webinars. And um, final thoughts, Professor? Well, just in general, Chinese medicine is just quite extraordinary. Um, it, can, it can treat almost anything. There's a few cases where Western medicine has done things better, like in the AIDS uh, epidemic. Western medicine found a cure. Chinese medicine was just helping people be comfortable. But things like uh, you know, non-serious COVID or colds, flu, Chinese medicine can be very, very effective in treating that. Obviously, if you have COVID, you're gonna, and if you're very sick, just get some Western medicine help. You don't wanna risk your life. But if you just have mild symptoms and they don't want you to come into the hospital, or if you have a cold or a flu, or you wanna prevent cold or flu, or you wanna strengthen your system, Chinese medicine is extraordinarily effective for that. But try to, try to go through a, a a skilled practitioner. Because if you try to just read a book and prescribe things for yourself, um, as the one person mentioned, you'll know just enough to be dangerous. So you know, these are, it's a very powerful type of medicine. So you want to be really careful. 
I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. I think we were a little bit even more cavalier as students before we learned about some of the ways that the herbs are so very potent that we would take anything, try anything, this and that. And then again, that would that was fun in, in a certain way where we had one time an herbal tasting party where everybody made decoctions and we all tried them, right? And that was so much fun. There was nothing dangerous about doing that because we knew what not to take, but we forgot about combining absolutely every herb on the planet <laughs> under, the, under the sun um, together. And we all felt quite nauseous at a certain point. So your acupuncturist would be a great resource for how to combine these herbs, the potency of them, and maybe you wanna become an acupuncturist. So we did actually put right there in the chat, the Calendly links for um, Liz and Eleanor. Some of the folks on here are asking, can you take just herbal classes and, and kind of get started? Absolutely. You can be a non-degree seeking student at Five Branches. Um, you can get yourself uh, you know, set up very easily to do so. And um, we do want you to get a chance to experience this medicine. Um, like Professor Bill said, it has, I would say changed everyone's life that is in front of you because we all became acupuncturists usually from that seeking within that inner experience and, and the um, inspiring nature of the medicine and the curiosity that we have. So thank you for your curiosity about the herbs. We'll be following up with, um, you know, this recording, we'll be sending it to you. And um, we really look forward to hearing from you. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Bill Schoenbart, one of my first professors at school. And now we get to be colleagues. It is a joy. So thank you so much. And Sean, I think we're just about done. So we'll go ahead and, and close down. But oh, well, I see one more. I see one more. Can you mention any anti-inflammatory herb that can be safely made? Inflammation is an extraordinarily broad term. So honestly, it just depends on the type of inflammation you're talking about. Mm. I mean, inflammation can be anything from a sore elbow to cancer. So it really depends what you mean. Um, broadly anti-inflammatory that's fairly safe that you can just buy a supplement, sore muscles. Um, try turmeric. I was gonna say turmeric. I was gonna say the golden lattes that you sometimes see at Pete's Coffee, um, you know, sometimes little coffee shops. I was in Philadelphia and I was doing an acupuncture project and they had the little golden latte. It's made of turmeric. So if you could find a golden latte or a turmeric latte, that can be excellent for sore muscles. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. Well, any further questions? We absolutely want to hear them. And, um, and we'll go ahead and send you sort of a, a follow up email you can reply to. And thank you once more again. We look forward to seeing you maybe as students in the future. Thank you all.